to ask you this morning a very important question, something that I think we don't really dwell on enough, and it's something that you're going to have to really focus on and be honest with yourself about. The question is, what motivates you to serve God? Why do you do what you do? And that's a personal question. That's not a give me a, a cookie cutter answer. That's something that as I'm asking you this right now, think about within yourself, answer within yourself, what motivates you to serve God? There are a lot of different answers that you can give, and I want to go over some of those possible answers today and talk about them from a scriptural perspective. The different motivations that we can have for serving the Lord, and we'll make some points and comments along the, uh, those lines along the way. Some people serve God because they are afraid of going to hell. They don't want to go to hell. Consider Luke chapter 12. Turn over there with me. Luke chapter 12. Scripture indicates that this is a motivation, a legitimate motivation for serving the Lord. Luke chapter 12 and verse 4. Jesus says, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Jesus tells his disciples, don't fear people who, who just have the power to kill you. No, no, fear God. Fear the one who has the authority to cast you into hell after he has killed you. He is the one that you should be afraid of. And the implication is you should serve him and obey him. Because you are afraid of him. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31. The Hebrew writer says, It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so, yes, these scriptures do tell us, yes, we should be afraid of hell. More importantly, we should fear the Lord who has the authority to cast us into hell. We recognize that evildoers, ones who do not submit to God, are the ones cast into hell. And so we submit ourselves to God's will to be spared from everlasting punishment. And that is a motivation for serving the Lord. But on the opposite side of that, People also serve the Lord because they want to go to heaven. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, just a page or two over from where we are right now. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 13. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them, having welcomed, having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And this is talking about various uh, heroes of faith, as we sometimes call them. And it says that they looked to heaven. They looked for something else. They didn't desire a, a country here on earth, nor, nor the country that they left, but a heavenly country that God has prepared for them. That was their desire. And that is why they serve God. That's what the Hebrew writer is saying here. And when we read descriptions of heaven... And what it will be like in the Bible, why wouldn't we want to go there? Here's one such description in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And look at verse 3. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them. And they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. <coughs> When you read a description like this, how can you not be motivated to go to heaven? Have you ever been so sad that the tears would just not stop flowing? Have you ever had pain? Pain that just wouldn't go away? Have you ever experienced loss such as the loss of a loved one? Have you been in mourning? I think we all have had at least some of those things happen to us, if not all. And if you've experienced that, then when you read of this place where those things don't exist, aren't you motivated to go there? Yes, I am, and I believe you would be too. And so, yes, we are motivated to serve God because we want to go to heaven. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five. And look at verse one. Second Corinthians five, verse one. Paul says here, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. We serve God because like Paul described, we are weary and we're tired. We're groaning in this earthly tent to be put in our heavenly home, to put on that heavenly home for all eternity. And that is the motivator. Another motivator we might have is obedience to parents. And you might scratch your head to, to see that on the list, but I'd say this is especially the case with young children who serve God and worship Him because their parents have told them to. They don't fully understand what is required of them yet, but they do want to please their parents. And this is legitimate. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And look at verse 1. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. Now, in no way am I suggesting that someone should solely serve God because that's what their parents want them to do. That shouldn't be the sole motivator. But I do believe that it can be a motivator even for the older. I think about my walk with God, and one thing I think about if I'm tempted to, to stray from, uh, from God and tempted to sin is, what would my parents think about that? Would I be bringing honor to them and their, their name? What would my grandparents think of that? And that is a motivator that I have, and maybe you have, to serve the Lord. And I think it is legitimate, as we read here in Ephesians, that we are to honor our father and mother and bring honor to them. Another motivator we might have is guilt from doing what is wrong. All of us understand from scriptures that we have a conscience and that when it is functioning properly, it makes us feel guilty and sorry for the wrong that we've done. Turn over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 kind of explains this idea of a conscience. Verse 17, Therefore to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So that is our, our conscience in essence, that when we know the right thing to do, we don't do it, that is sin. That, that goes against our conscience, that's wrong. And guilt indeed is a motivator to turn from our sins to serve God. 
Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7. And look at verse 10. Second Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So he talks about the, the motivation that the Corinthians had in whatever uh, they were had done wrong. And there is some uh, debate about whether this is the man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that they're talking about. Paul is talking about or something else, but they were rectifying something that they had done wrong, specifically to Paul. And Paul says that there was a godly sorrow that produced repentance and it produced an earnestness, a zeal to do what is right. We are motivated by our conscience to do what is right. Every single person desires to have a clear conscience. Nobody wants this nagging feeling in the back of their head that says, I've done something wrong. And I want you to notice what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Talking about this idea of a clear conscience. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 21 Peter says, corresponding to that baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter talking about baptism, he says that baptism is an appeal to God for a good conscience. We want our conscience to be clean. And that is what motivates us to be saved from sin. To have a clean conscience. And so yes. Guilt is a motivator. And kind of on the opposite side of that. Is wanting to be a good person. Our conscience doesn't just convict us when we do wrong. But it also motivates us to do what's right. And that is a legitimate motivation for serving God. Turn over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And look at verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. God people, God wants his people to be a people who are zealous, that is, fervently motivated to do good works. And yes, we can be motivated by wanting to do what's right. Some people serve God because they are compelled to by the evidence that God is God and that we should listen to him. I find a similar sentiment in the book of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verse 19. We've studied this recently in our Bible class. Peter and John are before the council. And notice what it says of them in verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Now some translations say we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. And the sense that I get from this is that the evidence was so overwhelming and the implications of that evidence was so overwhelming to the apostles that they were compelled to obey it and to speak about it. 
the evidence today for us is so overwhelming when we think about the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and, and what that implies for our lives, that it should motivate us to serve him. Not only to serve him, but also to preach the gospel among men. I want you to look at these motivators. And by no means is this a complete list. You may think of some. But I think this is a pretty good list as far as what can motivate a person to serve God. There are a lot of good reasons up here to serve God, but I tell you that ultimately, I don't think that these motivations are enough. There's something better that we need to aspire to. There's something greater that should motivate us, and it's the greatest motivator of all. And that's love. Love is the greatest motivator, specifically our love for God. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Start reading with me in verse 35. Jesus is being tested by the Pharisees and it says in Matthew 22 verse 35, One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher... Which is the greatest command, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The great commandment in all the law and the prophets is to love the Lord with all of our heart, and our soul, and our mind. Why? Why is that the great commandment? Because if you love someone, you are putting them above yourself. No longer are we concerned with what we want. We are concerned with what God wants. The purest motivations in this world, I would put this to the test and think that it is absolutely true that the purest motivations in this world are those that move beyond self, move beyond our selfish desires and move towards something greater. I believe it's the case in AA Alcoholics Anonymous that they tell you to find some higher power to answer to. To, to look towards. Why? Because they want you to move beyond yourself. Well, this command does that. We move beyond ourselves and we focus on what God wants. But someone might have the question, why should I love God? And to our, our Christian ears, that might offend us. And I can understand why it would. But I do think it is a good question. Why should we love God? Well, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4 and look at verse 15. First John 4 verse 15 says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. 
Notice what he says in verse 19. We love because he first loved us. Some translations there say we love him because he first loved us. And I think that's a fine translation because it shows that our motivation to love comes from the love that God has poured out on us. When we contemplate what God has done for us, how can we have any other response but love for Him? And if you want to look at what God has done for us, turn over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And look at verse 6. Romans 5 verse 6 says, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then over in John 3.16, you can turn over there, you may know it by memory. But let's turn over to John 3.16. Christ said here, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. When you think about what God has done for us, that we were at enmity with him, that we did things contrary to his nature, things contrary to his will, we hurt him. We often don't think about sin and how it affects God. But multiple times in the scriptures it says that God had great sorrow over man because of what man did. And I don't think it's, it's wrong to say that we hurt God when we sin against Him over and over. And yet, God loved us so much that He sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sin. His only Son. He died for us. He, he went through unspeakable <coughs> torture and pain for us. He left heaven for us. We talked earlier about what a wonderful place heaven is and how, by comparison, earth is not. And how we want to, to leave this earth of pain and sorrow and we want to go to heaven. Well, Christ did the opposite. He left the glories and the riches of heaven and he came down to earth and lived among this pain and sorrow and, and felt it himself and endured agony for us. He gave himself that we might live. And when you're confronted with what Christ has done for you, I dare say that you don't have a heart beating in you if you don't love him. When you truly contemplate God's love for us, how can you say anything other than we love him because he loved us first? And that has to be our ultimate motivator. I'm not saying that the rest of these don't also go into that. But I will say one thing. <clears throat> you notice in 1 John 4, it said that perfect love casts out fear. I find that interesting because I, I know so many Christians deal with that, that guilt and that fear, that fear of going to hell. Am I right with God? Perfect love casts out fear. Fear involves punishment, but with proper love, we don't have to fear.
But you think about wanting to go to heaven. You think about obeying your parents. You don't want to be guilty. You, you want to be a good person. You're compelled by the evidence. All those are fine. But ultimately, if you want to be successful in your service to God, your motivation has to come from love for Him. And that should be a natural thing, again, when you've seen what God has done for you. And so this morning, as we conclude, I would ask you, do you love the Lord? Again, that's a difficult question. That's a very personal question. Do you love God and want to serve Him? And let me say, in a sense, it's okay to say you don't. Now let me explain that. You're being honest with yourself and you haven't come to that yet. At least you're honest with yourself. I'd be happy to work with you. I'd be happy to help you. And that's a step in the right direction to recognize that you don't have the love for God that you need to have. Perhaps you're not, uh, <clears throat> perhaps you're not a Christian. Perhaps you recognize that you haven't had the love for God that He has shown for you and you want to obey the gospel. Appeal to God for that good conscience according to 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 21. We can do that this morning. Or perhaps you are a Christian and perhaps you haven't been showing the love for God that you know you ought to. Know that you can repent and that God will forgive you. He is faithful and just to forgive Everyone who truly turns away from their wrong. If you have any need this morning, won't you come while we stand and sing?